dear ones. You're listening to the What God Is Not podcast with Father Michael O'Loughlin and Sister Natalia. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory forever. <laughs> Hello, Father Michael. Hello, Sister Natalia. It's been so long since we last talked. Like a whole five minutes. I know. I missed you in those five minutes. All right, I'm done. Um, Olivia. When I was here. on Catholics, sorry, go ahead. Docomos Olivia is here. Banter fight. <laughs> Go ahead. Wait, when you were on Catholic stuff, what? When I was on Catholic stuff, oh man, I, I just totally spaced what I was going to say. I totally spaced it like in that, in, that, in that three second period. That's worse than usual for you. I totally spaced it. Yeah, that is it's worse than usual. Look, I wonder if something's going on with Squadcast because our internet, both times we've recorded today, our internets were both totally fine until yep. we hit the record button. Like even when we were using the video and stuff before, it wasn't until we hit the record button and then we hit the record button and both of our Wi-Fi's started going wacko. Um, and they kind of do it together. Like they both go bad and then they, it's yeah. just anyways, um, which is horrible because last episode, I just had a really hard time with a delay. Although you said you think that maybe it didn't come across and that's good. But this episode, I'll just talk the whole time and you don't have to say anything and then they won't even notice that there's a delay. Perfect. You think I can go the whole time without saying anything? <laughs> That's a challenge I do not think I could, I do not think I could live up to. Um, anyways, Dokimos Olivia Dokimos Olivia's, Olivia's, Olivia's there. Hi, Dokimos Olivia. Sure. Hello. <laughs> That's the whole story. I should turn, Hello. in case we ever use oh. this video, I should turn it so she can say hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Um, Good to see your face and hear your voice. About? Um, <laughs> you're putting a lot of thought into this. I know because I can't think of anything. And the last time I couldn't think of anything, I started talking about. We can do a banterless um, episode. And you made fun of me. Okay, great. That's good because um, this episode actually, I was thinking that I maybe want to split into two episodes or maybe even more, depending on how it goes. So we'll see what happens. Wow. Um, I, okay. yeah, I have a lot to say about this one. So uh, Do it. first though, right I want to give a shout out to, I want to give a shout out to a listener who sent us a really beautiful letter um, about the positive fruits our podcast has borne in her life and her family's life. And so I just wanted to give a shout out to, I guess the whole family. So Hannah, Samuel, Ruth, and Nicholas. And she also sent me, she was, we were just on the last episode talking about these listeners who get like really creative in their gift giving. And mm -hmm. Olivia, I shared about the, you'll hear this when you listen to the episode, but I shared about the um, listener who sent us the Amazon gift card for me to buy things for the other nuns, which was fun. People, I just keep saying people are so generous. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I was never that generous. <laughs> I also never had Amazing. money, really. So that's yeah, part of I it. never had money, but I still. But I also like I wouldn't have even anyways, yes, I agree. People's generosity is astounding. And um so Hannah was one of those very generous people and very creative people. She sent me um some stationery with a really beautiful pen and some stickers. And um, it was just really, it was a great, uh, a great gift idea because um, our listeners know how much I love to write letters. And if you've written me a letter and I haven't written you back yet, it's definitely only because I am very behind because there are lots of letters, not because I'm not going to write you back. That's the whole story. That's a very good thing. I'm glad to hear that she sent you stationery because she sent you what you like using. Because she sent me <laughs> soap, and so it's not like it's not like what I need to use because I don't use, but it's what I do use, and oh, I love it's like so that. So it wasn't like it's an like that hippie soap that you need to use. Soap. No, it wasn't like you you could use this. Um, <laughs> so that's that's a that's a funny story. Um, so I don't think she might be telling this, but like um, Father Nathan's wife Allie, um, Father Nathan uh, Simeon's wife Allie is. We always kind of joke that that she's just kind of becoming my sister because we can like be completely mm -hmm. honest with each other, and so she literally bought me. Or she said she didn't buy it, but I think she bought it. I think she's just being nice, um, like 
white teeth whitening stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, and she's like, um, you just have, you just, you have such a beautiful smile, but you do drink a lot of coffee and left like the little pen thing on there. And I'm like, <laughs> and then That's she's amazing. like, so did you get my little gift? I was like, oh, you are totally my sister. Like, I, I appreciate that. Um, but I don't have any wife to tell me, um, you know, you, they have this thing so you can whiten your teeth. So anyway, I don't even know how to um, use it. I'm That's just like really funny because I thought you where it? you were going with that. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I thought you were going I, where I thought you were going with that was about how um, you got soap, but Allie actually recently told you that you smelled good um, because it was the same day that I was like, Father Michael, you smell yeah. really good today. And you were like, why is everyone saying that? Um, so, but you always smell good. So even when you're, anyways, so um, that's a weird thing to say on the podcast. You want to shit smell good. <laughs> Olivia's looking at me like, what are you saying? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Um, we've gotten we've gotten a few emails recently where people are like, I really like that you guys show your humanity. And so I'm like, I'm glad because <laughs> I don't know how to not. <laughs> I don't know how to not. Anyways, if we ever guess, get if we ever get if we ever make t shirts and we have quotes from the podcast on it, that's me one of your quotes. I don't know how to not. I don't that's know all how gonna to say. not. <laughs> I don't know how to not. Like, I don't know how to not show my Meaning humanity. Meaning TMI. Is, do you understand that's what yeah, I was saying? I okay. totally do. I just okay. think it was a very funny phrase. I don't know how to not. Um, okay, so I'm going to get into the topic. And we kind of did just banter a little bit. But it was also a shout out. So it was both of those things. Um, we've also gotten a lot of emails recently from listeners who are talking about how much they love our banter. And I usually reply with, um, I hate that we banter and father Michael loves it. And usually listeners agree with him more than they agree with me. So at least regarding banter. Um, by the way, Hannah also sent me stickers and I love stickers. So thank you, Hannah, for the stickers and the soap. I was halfway drunk with the soap, but I do use soap, but I also like stickers. Thank you. To the topic. <laughs> Okay, the topic. Can, can Olivia so hear me? This, yeah, yeah, I'm using the earphone splitter. That's okay. why she's laughing. Okay. I was going to say, is she you like just, just laughing like, at random things? You think I'm just like, you're cute to laugh every time you say what? something? <laughs> she's just, I don't she's know. She's just over there scrolling through Instagram I'm just and laughing confused. at me. I'm just confused. I'm just confused. Go ahead. I'm going to shut up now. Thank you. So the we're recording this on August 27th which means as of today, there is less than a month until my life profession. Presumably, I'll believe it when I see it. You know, I've been telling people, write it with pencil, not pen. But um, who knows what's going to, you know, I'm going to get COVID or the bishop's going to get COVID or whatever. It's going to be delayed again. Anyways, it's not. It's going to happen. It's going to happen on September 26th. We're going to have the Belgian triple that we brewed called Triple Delayed. We're going to have the milk stout that we brewed called Milk and Nunny. And at the reception, not at the liturgy, because that would be weird. Um, and it's going to be wonderful. But the episode, this episode is being released on September 15th. And as, I, as, we've, as I've said for the listeners before, the liturgy for the life profession is going to be live streamed. It will be live streamed from the monastery's Facebook page. So I think it's facebook.com slash Christ the Bridegroom. Um, Olivia is giving a shrug. She also doesn't know, but excuse me. I, if you search Christ the Bridegroom Monastery on Facebook, you'll find it, whatever. It's going to be live streamed from there. So because of that, I thought it would be nice since this is coming out a week and a half before to, um, kind of walk people through what the life profession service looks like and so that they can know what to expect and know what they're actually seeing. That way it's not trying to just process it all in the moment because there is a lot in this service and it's a really beautiful service. And I just thought that would be helpful. And if you're not going to watch the live stream, then you get to hear about what a life profession service is like anyways. Um, and we'll save the video on our Facebook page. So even if you don't watch it live, you can watch it later if you want what do you think, Father Amen. Michael? And a quick, uh, quick question. Are you going to cut yourself off? Or if, if it goes long, I, I kind of hope it does because this is a beautiful topic. Um, so are you going to cut yourself off and say like, this is a good stopping point. We're about at an hour. Or do you want me to do that for you, in other words? Yeah, I'll do that. Mm -hmm. I can do okay. that. And I 
Um, I'm so so. What I plan on doing is going through basically going through my prayer journal, um, sharing selectively from my pre-profession retreats because when I was on retreat with you nice. in LA, Father Michael. This is this is what we did for the whole retreat, right? Is I just spent each of my holy hours I prayed with um what ended up being about a page of the life profession service. So I just want to go through kind of what I was reflecting on as I was praying with those things and uh and share that. So yeah. Excellent. Good. Okay. So the life profession will start with um we will do a hierarchical liturgy, which means at the beginning of the liturgy, the bishop is going to be vested in the center of the church, which we, at some point you were saying, Father Michael, you want to talk about the vesting prayers of a bishop because those are incredible and there's a lot there. So we're yes. not going to do that right now, but at another point we might. And then the liturgy starts, there's the entrance, so on and so forth. And then we get to the part of the liturgy um, where we have the Treparian and the Kentuckian of the day, which will be for Sunday as well as for um, as well as for the falling asleep of John the Evangelist, which is the feast for September 26th. So we'll have both of those Treparian and Kentuckian and such. And then um, we start a Treparian that's in a special melody, and it's the Treparian of the prodigal son. And at that point, where are you with this? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good point. So, um, up till, up until the tropars or maybe like the Holy God or something like that. I'm not sure the exact point. Sister Petra and I, Sister Petra is making her life profession with me. Sister Petra and I will be with all the other nuns, um, up in the front pew or whatever. And we'll be vest, vested is not the right word. We'll be dressed in, um, what we're normally dressed in for liturgy as Rasafor nuns, which is what we are at this moment. So we'll have on our, our Riasa, our Scufia, the soft hat, and um, we'll be up with all the other nuns. And then at um, some point, maybe around the Holy God, Sister Petra and I go into the back of the church and somewhere back there, we're going to get changed. And we'll be changed into... Um, holy people. No, um, I mean, actually we're changing our clothes. <laughs> we get changed into what's called the Vlashenitsa, which is, um, which is a white garment and, um, symbolic of a baptismal garb. So, um, no veil, no habit, no shoes. We're just in this, this white garment, um, barefoot, hair down, all of that, right? Um, so we go and get changed while they're singing the other Troparian. And then... Um, and no one has seen your hair in five years. I think that's just be a cool moment. Yeah. Like no one has uh, seen your hair besides you and your doctor and your sisters in five years. Correct, yeah. So, and I'll get to that because that was like part of the reflection. So... Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Um, no, it's fine. Please... You know, definitely, definitely interject. So, um, so as the troparian is sung, um, the the members. Um, well, I'll just read. I'll just read what it says in the profession booklet at this point. Um, in the narthex, the candidate lays aside her customary habit and clothes herself in the vlashenitsa, a white garment similar to the baptismal robe. As the troparian is sung, the members of the monastery go to the narthex where they form a procession holding lit candles. So this is all the other all the other members of the monastery, the other nuns and Docomos Olivia. They process in pairs into the nave of the church. That's where the people stand, like the congregation. They process in pairs into the nave of the church with the candidate coming in last, supported on each side by her sponsor and the ecclesiarch. So I'll be I'll be walked in um, and on either side of me will be Mother Theodora and you, Father Michael. Um, Those are very boring which, terms for what should be spiritual mother and spiritual father. Well, this isn't really... Anyways, um, the 
Uh, do you, I don't know if you remember this. I, I've maybe brought it up to you since then. I don't remember. But at Mother Cecilia and Mother Gabriella's life profession, they were life professed um, like a month and a half after I came to the monastery. So I was at their life profession, obviously. You were at their life profession. And then you and I were sitting at the reception mm-hmm. afterwards. And, um, and you looked at me and you just said, I better be the one to walk you down the aisle. And I was like, well, I still want to choose my <laughs> spiritual father. But... Um, but you are going to be the one walking down the aisle, unless you really piss me off in the next month. <laughs> so, um, okay, so I'll be supported on each side by you and Mother Theodora. Clothed in the Vlashenitsa, she walks between these two, barefooted, and with hands folded upon her breast as though they were bound. On entering the nave, she prostrates once to the east and again in the middle of the nave, and a third prostration immediately in front of the royal doors. After this prostration, she does not rise immediately, but remains prostrate, praying silently to the Lord that her sins be forgiven and that she may be received into the ranks of the penitent. Um, I was just, I was reading that very carefully because I told you on retreat, Father Michael, that I'm really worried that one of these times I'm going to mispronounce the word prostrate and, <laughs> and it's going to be really embarrassing. Um, <clears throat> but I didn't. I said prostrate. So, um, <laughs> we're going to edit that out. Oh, oh. <laughs> no, we won't. So, so the, very first, um, the very first thing I was praying with was actually that first sentence. The candidate lays aside her customary habit and clothes herself in the Vlashenitsa. Um, because this, this part of the profession is what, and I've talked to some of the other nuns about this and asked how they felt about it when they did their profession and things like that. But this part of the profession, thinking about it has always made me very nervous. Like I just know that when I walk down the aisle dressed like that, I'm going to feel totally naked. Um, Because as you pointed out, Father Michael, nobody except for the other nuns and um, on occasion, like when doctors, have to. Nobody has seen my hair since my tonsure in 2016. So it's been five years. Um, I don't even, like my family doesn't see my hair. Um, when I'm on home visit, I'm, I wear my habit and everything. Um, so it's just like, I, I know that I'm just going to feel naked. And I was, I was praying on retreat about, um, about like why that nakedness makes me nervous. And the image that came to mind is, and I, I showed you the picture, Father Michael, but the image that came to mind in prayer was um, uh, a picture that I had taken when I was on home visit, visiting um, my nephew and my niece because my nephew was playing outside in the dirt. He's three. He's playing outside in the dirt with his little excavator toy, totally naked. And he just was like, there was such freedom. Like you just see that he is living the dream (laughs) and he's so happy to be naked and he's so happy to be playing on his excavator. And it's just like the cutest thing in the world. Um, And I realized that, um, so I I actually had with me on retreat the same phone that I had on home visit. So I, I was looking at this picture and it actually was part of my prayer. And um, hmm. and I realized as I was praying with it that, um, my nephew, um, I don't have his shamelessness. Like I'm afraid to be seen and, um, like with my guards down unprotected. And the reason that I'm nervous, um, is because I'm prideful. So, Um, I was realizing that this walk down the aisle is a walk of the utmost humility. And, um, I, I know that a lot of people, and this is part of the reason I wanted to do this podcast. Like I want people to be very clear on what a life profession of a monk or a nun is, because there's a lot of misconception And I think like even people who have been to the life profession service, you're going to hear all of these words. I'm going to have all these words to back up what I'm saying. And I think a lot of people who have been like those words don't even register. What registers for a lot of people, what they think is like, this is a heroic moment. And 
how inspiring that this woman is giving herself totally to the Lord. It's totally self-sacrificial. She, she's giving up all of these other things and, um, and how virtuous and how beautiful and so on and so forth. And, and, and a lot of that is true, right? I'm not, I'm not saying that, um, that there's not some truth there, but that is not the deepest reality of what a life profession is. Um, at least that's not the deepest reality that's portrayed in all of the prayers that we say at this service. So, um, because like this walk, this walk down the aisle is not showing people that I've like made it to holiness, right? It's not saying this is the epitome of virtue. It's actually quite the opposite. I come, um, I come barefoot, poor (laughs) with nothing to offer, but myself, like we don't even wear, um, if we wear glasses, we take off our glasses. We're taking, we won't wear our watch. We won't, Mm -hmm. I I have to wear compression sleeves because otherwise I'm going to pass out in the middle of the aisle because pots, but, um, but we come with our, our hands folded across our chest. As I read in the, um, in that little part from the service and, um, bound by my own sin. And so as, as Mm -hmm. I, um, as I read in the um, in the profession service, I'll prostrate thrice as I come closer and closer to the Lord, and that's not just that's not just humility, right? Like I often, um, I, I know you make the same distinction, Father Michael, but when when I talk to people about why we don't um, kneel during divine liturgy, like for, for Roman Catholics, it's it's very strange often that we don't kneel during the divine liturgy, and I say. Um, that's because kneeling in the East is a sign of penance. And the divine liturgy is not meant to be penitential. Um, it's meant to be a celebration. And in the, in the West, kneeling is a sign of humility. So it makes sense to kneel during the consecration. But in the East, it's a sign of penance. Um, whereas for us, the, the humility is a, is a profound bow. Um, and, but in the East, kneeling is a sign of penance. Prostrating is an even greater sign of penance. And so... I'm not just prostrating out of humility. I'm prostrating out of penance. <laughs> like this is a sign of, this is a sign of penance. Um, mm. And then at the final prostration, I remain prostrate. And then, and then remember what the service says. Um, re- the, at, after this, this prostration, she does not rise immediately, but remains prostrate, praying silently to the Lord that her sins be forgiven and that she may be received into the ranks of the penitent. Like, (laughs) I'm asking to be received into the ranks of the penitent, um, to spend the rest of my life um, repenting for my sin and um, and for the sins of the world. And... um, and I remember, and I've sh- I think I've shared this before on the podcast, but it's part of what I put into my letter requesting life profession, um, the letter that I wrote to Mother Theodora. I quoted a monk who had come and given us a retreat at the monastery one time, and he was talking about the profession service. And he said, um, <clears throat> when you make those prostrations at your life profession, you should be saying, Lord, I need this life of recovery. Um, I need this life of healing from my own sin. And... Um, and this is emphasized, I think, because like what's being sung as I'm coming down the aisle is not here comes the bride. (laughs) It's not, it's not even O Virgin Pure, you know, O Virgin Pure, you know, um, it's the troparian of the prodigal son, as I mentioned earlier. So it's like, it's a crying out that I have lived like the prodigal, that my heart is impoverished, that I'm repentant for having sinned against heaven and before God. Um, so, so what are people, um, I'm, I'm wrapping up this holy hour as I, uh, yeah, but, um, so what people are actually seeing as I walk down the aisle is a proclamation of my sinfulness, a crying out for mercy, a statement that I need this life of recovery. Like I was quoting earlier from that monk. Um, and of course it's also beautiful and it's also joyous. Um, but I think, for me, what, what struck me, and I shared this with you on retreat, the reason that it's so beautiful and so joyous is not um, is not just because I'm I'm leaving the world, I'm dying to the world, and giving everything to the Lord. It's because I'm I'm doing that as conversion. Um, 
like I I was thinking of um I was thinking of the verse there's there's much rejoicing in heaven over one repentant sinner. Um like more more so than the 99 faithful, you know. And um yeah, so I just was like that's what makes it joyous. It, it it's it's the joy of all of these people are seeing the repentance of a sinner. Um that's what makes it joyous and that's what makes it beautiful is uh like that's what this this walk down the aisle is. It's a sermon, it's a sermon to those who are watching because it's a call to repentance. Like for all of us, it's a call to radical conversion and to the shameless nakedness of my nephew, to the shameless nakedness of Adam and Eve before the fall. Um, yeah. I don't think you shared that with me when we chatted. That's really beautiful that that's why it's joyful is because we in the congregation- I totally shared it with you because you were place. like, wow, that's really beautiful. <laughs> oh, that's right. Okay. <laughs> I don't remember, but anyway, um, <laughs> but anyway, it's uh, I, I I have I I now <laughs> I I now have a renewed a second experience of being in awe of uh, of the way that Jesus speaks through you. But um, that that is really beautiful that that we stand in the place of the angels, which is probably exactly what I said when we talked on retreat. Um, but um, that we stand in the place of the angels and we we find it joyful because the angels rejoice in the in the repentance of ones that are in here. Here we have this. Um, so thank you for that. I think that is. That is amazing. But um, also just real mm-hmm. quick, in the, in the East as in the West used to have, we, we have actually like a, a rank of penitent, like that, that's actually a, a state you can be in. Um, this used to be the case uh, throughout Christianity um, when somebody would, would confess their sins, but they could not receive the Eucharist yet because a lot of times you'd actually go to confession and then receive a penance and you would not receive absolution until the penance was done. So, I mean, like stereotypically in the West, this would be like, okay, I, I, I committed adultery. Okay, well then go fight in the Crusades. And and when you come back, I'll give you absolution. So like the, the the whole time they were fighting the Crusades, they were penitents. So it was it was a rank of penitent. You would go a long time doing your penance before you were received absolution. Not the case anymore, of course. Um, but in, today we still do have penitents. Those who either by their own choice or the guidance of their spiritual director have said you need to go a time of do a time of penance before you can receive, uh, before you can return to communion, before you can return to the mysteries. Um, and one of those instances is for some reason, uh, for, uh, for one example, is those who, who uh, we even call, and this seems kind of odd, but we even call uh, Protestants penitents if, they, if they're going through uh, classes to receive the Eucharist in, in our church because they were baptized into the one Christ, right? There's not a Protestant Jesus and the Catholic Jesus, right? There's only one. So they were baptized into the same Christ we are baptized into. One's baptism, one baptism. But but <clears throat> before they can receive the Eucharist or, or chrismation in our church, they need to go through this time of, of as if they separate themselves. So their baptism, they in a sense were, again, this is not kind of law, but in, a, in, the, in their baptism, they were baptized in the one body of Christ. And then they separated themselves from that or, or were separated from that by the will of their parents or godparents by not letting them receive chr- chrismation or Eucharist. And then, so they, they want to return. So this period of penitence is the time where you are in that state until that is taken away when you're able to receive the Eucharist again. Um, so again, I, I love the fact that you brought this up, because what you're saying is people don't become a penitent because they want to, you know, they become a penitent because they sinned and, and now they have to do something or wait a period of time until they can receive the Eucharist again. Um, what what this is saying for monks and nuns is that they have chosen to into the ranks of penitent. It does not mean that they cannot receive the Eucharist. That's not what we mean by this, but they're in a sense joining that same rank of saying, I've chosen to live a life of penance. And one final thought on this before we go on is that, um, you know, the East is very eloquent and I've, you know, shout out to Andrew Whaley. We've been having this discussion a while now about, you know, the East is pretty explicitly saying that that the life of a monk or a nun, that life of asceticism and penance is the ideal. We've, we've talked about this before. Every Christian should kind of aim at that ideal and find themselves wherever they are in between, you know, uh, a complete separation from God and then the holiness that is pursued, especially and most intensely by monks and nuns. Um, but it, it's, it's similar to that, like, you know, not all of us know, and I know most probably more than anybody else in this whole world, sister. And I said this to you that, you know, you are not the worst sinner in the world. Like 
like you 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 are you are very sincere and I know, I know, roll your eyes all you want, but like, like there's like, you, you are, you are really striving for holiness in a way that it would be really awkward if you said that. Um, but, but, but I, I, I can say that, you know, and it's, it's, and those of us who know you can say that. Um, so like, it, we're not saying you're becoming a nun because, you know, you're the worst sinner in the world. Um, now, again, you've quoted St. Paul and according to the gifts God has given you, you are because you have, you've rejected those gifts and, and therefore have separated yourself from him. Like all of us, to all of us can say that we're the worst sinners in the world as St. Paul says himself, um, mm-hmm. or the worst of sinners, you know, the, mo- the, the greatest of sinners. But um, so you are choosing to live the life that most of us should live. Right, so it's not that 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 some of us can live lives in the world like me without being a monk. Um, that I can live a life in the world and and not have to be a monk. That's not what I'm saying. Like what we're saying here is, I should be a monk. I should be living a life of of, of extreme asceticism and penance. But God has called me to do something else for the sake of the kingdom of God. Um, God is calling you, um, and it's your choice to become a nun to live a life of asceticism. And the, what I thought about when you were saying at this time was that, you know. We, Christ carries his cross and many of us like me, I'll, I'll be the first to admit, don't have very heavy crosses. Thank God, I would probably be crushed. But, but those who, whenever we willingly sacrifice, whenever we do, you know, meatless Fridays, whenever we give up things for during the fasts, um, we are willingly helping, we are willingly participating in Christ's cross, willfully. Like we are saying, I don't need, I can be eating meat, I could be eating, I could, I, could, I could not only disobey the teachings of the church, but I could just do the bare, bare minimum during these fasts and not carry a cross, not sacrifice too much. Um, but those who are able and who are willing to carry this heavier burden, willingly take up their cross and, and follow after Christ, those who are able to do that are deciding to, to do what everybody should be doing. And so in a sense, it's a choice to participate more fully in the carrying of Christ's cross. And in your sense, you're choosing by the grace of God to participate more fully in the life that all of us should be participating in. So thank you for that. And God bless you for that. Hmm. Thanks. Um, I, by the way, I meant to say this at the beginning, but I'm going to need you and or Olivia to say something if you feel like I'm moving too slowly th- through this or going too in depth or something like that because I um it's like, fine. Okay. So um so as I go through I'm going to I'm going to read not all of the prayers and not all of the things that are said but specifically the things that I'm commenting on. And when we live stream, I think what I'm going to try to do is when we live stream this, I'm going to put a link um in the description or whatever of the live stream, I'm going to put a link to the booklet so that people who are watching can can read along if they want. They can read along to the ser- in the in the service. So, um, the next part that I had prayed with. So we have the the trepine of the prodigal son as um as we're going down, and then like I said, I remain prostrate, and then it says. Um, when the tropion has concluded, the bishop says in a loud voice to the prostrate candidate. So it's going to be interesting because, like I said, Sister Petra and I are both doing this. We're, we're both making our life profession together. Um, but he'll do, since I'm the monastic senior, I don't, I don't know what to call it, um, in this, like, hmm. I entered the monastery. I was tonsured before her. Um so Seniority, he'll do these things yeah. for me first and then um, we'll come to her second. But um, so the bishop will say to me, God, the merciful father who loves his children, sees your humility and true repentance, child. Um, and he receives you as a prodigal, one who repents and who falls down before him with a contrite heart. So again, we just see this theme of, of repentance, right? We're going to see this throughout. And immediately he bends down, takes the candidate's right hand and raises her from the ground. The candidate rises and stands with arms crossed on the breast and makes a reverent bow of her head towards the holy altar. So a couple things there. Um, I was I was reflecting on when the bishop says, so the bishop is, is speaking to me and he says that um, God, the fa- God the merciful father receives you as a prodigal. And um, I always like, I always like to talk about 
the word prodigal whenever the prodigal son comes up, because I remember hearing you preach about this years ago, but there's this, this misconception of people often think that mm-hmm. the prodigal son means the son who came back. Right. Um, but prodigal actually means reckless. <laughs> like, um, so right. we call him the prodigal son, not because he came back, but because he was reckless. So when it says he sees you as a prodigal, um, I was, first of all, I was, I was thinking about prodigal meaning reckless. And I was thinking about how often I'm teased at the monastery for, for being reckless. Mm. Um, and, uh, all the broken bones and the concussions and the tree climbing and the whatever. Um, and, but it's, it's delightful. Like it's very fun teasing and, uh, I love being known as reckless, but, but this is exactly how he receives me as, as a reckless one. And the beauty of that for me Mm. is, it's like in some sense he he sees me as a prodigal and so there's something here um about actually this is only coming to me in the in the moment it's not something that i had prayed with then but it's like it's it's interesting that he sees me as a prodigal like christ or god the merciful father um sees us as we really are which means he's seeing something of my identity here, not just my actions. Like it's not just prodigal actions. He sees me as one who is prodigal. Um, And the beauty of that is um, I think that this is these, um, my, my act of life profession here is saying, I want to make this transition from one who has recklessly sinned and wants to now recklessly love and repent. Um, And so it's like, I want to keep the recklessness, but I want that recklessness directed towards love of God. Like I want to have a reckless love of him. And, and it's kind of like I had shared with you, Father Michael, about how, um, how often, and I've probably shared this on the podcast before, but how often, the Lord uses our very, our, our places of greatest weakness. He uses as the places where we can really encounter him. Like the, the woman who poured the ointment out, the expensive, the expensive perfume. Um, you know, I remember hearing a priest talk about that one time. Um, shout out to Father Steve Flynn. Uh, he was, he was giving a talk to um, some people preparing for confession. And he was, he was talking about that story. And he said, why do you think that um, sinful woman had that expensive perfume? Like, what do you think that was used for? And of course, like the expensive perfume was used to attract customers, you know? Um, and right. um, and yet this became the place with which she encountered Christ. Like she totally gave that to him. Um, and so I think similarly, it's, it's, it's God sees me as a prodigal. He sees me as a reckless one. Um, and it's not like, he wants me to lose the recklessness. He just wants the recklessness directed towards him. Reoriented. Beautiful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so that was, that was my comment about the prodigal thing. But then the next part, when it says that the, the bishop, um, and this, I've always loved this part in seeing, so I've seen Mother Cecilia, Mother Gabriella, and Mother Eliana's life professions. And I'm, um, I'm always very moved by when the bishop, like there's something about, the humility of the bishop in this too, um, when he leans down and takes the hand of the candidate and helps her up from that last prostration. So um, I had kind of a twofold reflection on this. One was, um, it reminded me very much of um, part of my reflection from the transfiguration that we just talked about on the Instagram live a couple weeks ago. But when um, when the bishop, as the representative of Christ, raises me from the prostration with his touch, it reminds me of um, at the transfiguration when the, the, the apostles fall to the ground in fear and then Jesus touches them and, and they arise. Um, and... Um, and then the, the other, the other thing that it reminded me of was simply the, this is how we end confession in the East, right? If we have a traditional, um, Eastern confession, the, the penitent, um, there's that word again, the penitent is usually kneeling for the prayer of absolution, if not for the whole, um, for the whole 
confession. And then the priest will actually put his hand out and take the hand of the penitent and help them up. And it's symbolic of Christ helping them to a new start, a new beginning. And so so this reminded me of that as well, um, because obviously the bishop is standing in the place of Christ here. Um, Yeah. Beautiful. Um, Okay, so then we move into the bishop asks us a bunch of questions. Um, And the first question he asks is, why have you come, sister, falling down before the holy altar and this holy assembly? And, um, And the answer is, I desire the ascetic life, master. And... This, this became for me just a, a prayer of, you know, this is something, this was a, a theme that we talked about throughout the whole retreat, Father Michael, was this, this prayer of asking the Lord to purify my motivations. Because if I'm, if I'm totally honest, there are times when I don't fully know why I'm doing this or that, you know, um, including the life profession. Like mm-hmm. I'm, I'm very human. Um, as we talked about earlier, I don't know how to not. And um and so I, as a human, I have mixed motivations, you know? And so it's like, but at, at some point I, ha- I had to just make the act of trust that whatever of my motivations here are not totally pure, I'm just asking the Lord to purify them. Um, because it's, you know, I remember a, a priest um, who was giving a talk at one of our discernment retreats and and he said to the to the women on the retreat, um, let me try to get this right. He said, the only reason you come to the monastery is to die. And if you've come for any reason other than that, you are either going to leave or the Lord is going to purify all those other reasons you came. And the reason you came will end up being to die. Um, and I'm definitely in that latter part. Like, I think a lot of the reasons I came to the monastery were not necessarily like the purest motivations, but I also know that God meets me where I'm at and he uses all of those things. And, um, and he used those things to draw me in, in order to see the the deeper desires of my own heart. Um, so, um, yeah, that's what I wanted to say about that. Um, and, um, he asks if I desire to be counted worthy of the angelic schema and to be ranked in the company of monastics. And the answer is yes, master with God's help. So this is the first time that, that Mm. we say that we, um, the first time in our answers that we say with God's help, because I, I know that I can't do this on my own. Right. Um, and because it asks if I, if I desire to be counted worthy, not to be counted deserving. Um, like there, there's not something that I can do to earn, um, to earn this. It's, it's that I'm, I'm made worthy through Christ. And, um, and what I wanted to say there is, um, oh, I wanted to talk about the angelic schema. So the, the, the company of monastics um, is also known as, so at the end of the service, um, I'm skipping ahead to the end because I want to talk about the angelic schema. But at the end of the service, um, <laughs> in our booklet, it says, at the end of divine liturgy, a group picture will be taken. And then, <laughs> uh, and then the faithful approach the beginner <laughs> to, to kiss the hand cross. So um, the group picture isn't part of the ancient ritual, but the hand cross, um, the faithful will approach and kiss the hand cross. I don't know if this is going to happen or not at ours because COVID is the worst, but um, mm. typically you would go up to the, to the newly professed and um, everyone who's there will go up takes a very long time. And they say, what is your name, mother? And the beginner answers, pronouncing her new name. And each of the faith, so mother Natalia, and each of the faithful bows to the beginner and says, while departing, may you be saved in the angelic rank. So one of the cool things, I had shared this with you on retreat, Father Michael, I don't think you'd heard of it before, but one of the, I remember reading in, um, it was one of the Kyriakos Marquides books. I don't know if that's how you say his name. Um, I think it was Mountain of Silence that I was reading this in, that, the the monk um, with the pseudonym uh, Father Maximus, he 
shares that, it might not have been that book. I think it was that book. Um, anyways, wherever I was reading this, that one of the, one of the theories is that the fallen angels, um, so those like Satan and the other fallen angels, they um, were all of one rank. So we have different ranks of angels, right? We have the, um, the cherubim and seraphim and so on and so forth and the archangels and whatever. So whatever. Uh, and so the fallen angels were all of one rank. And so the monastics, this is again, just one theory. It's not like church dogma or something. The monastics, um, the ranks of angels that we're entering is to, is to replace that rank of angels, um, which is just super cool. Olivia's face says that she hasn't yes. heard this before either. And it's very cool. Um, <laughs> so, um, I mean, not liter. Okay. I should put, I'm really glad I just thought of this. I should put the, the, um, clarification out there. I'm not saying that we literally become angels. We do not become spiritual beings. Yeah. We are, um, as monastics, yeah. we are, we are human. And so in heaven, we will have, we will have our bodies in heaven, our resurrected bodies. We're not going to become angels in heaven. Cause that's, that's a huge misconception, right? When people are like, you know, such and such yes. went into heaven and they're an angel now. And like, no, that's not how it works actually. Um, so we won't be spiritual beings, pure spiritual beings. We'll be body and spirit. And yeah, great. Yes. Um, so uh, anyways, maybe no one was going to have that misconception, but I was worried about it. Um, okay, and then I'll share... Uh, this is all just still from the second holy hour, Father Michael. <laughs> um, the, That's fine. Uh, Do the it. The second holy hour of my Keep retreat. Going. Okay. Okay. So the um, part of what the bishop says in response to this, when I say, yes, with God's help, I desire to be counted worthy of the angelic scheme, so on and so forth. Um, part of what he says for the in response to this is he says, um, truly you have chosen a good and blessed work, but only if you fulfill it. For good works are conceived in toil, and brought forth with suffering. And I just was, one of the things I shared with you on retreat, Father Michael, is um, I was really struck by, like, this is the this is the time at which I'm going to start being called mother, right? We were talking about this recently. Um, I will, and and we've mentioned it several times on the podcast, like, I'll be called Mother Natalia. And, and this phrase really struck me, good works are conceived in toil and brought forth with suffering, because I was like, this is my motherhood. These are the labor pains. Mm -hmm. The good works are conceived and brought forth through each resurrection after each death to self. That's how we bring forth new life. Mm -hmm. Like that's how theosis happens. And, and that's how I become mother is, is this, this death to self brings forth new life. Um, and so that's what I was thinking of, of just the, the, the labor pains of, um, of good works being conceived in toil and brought forth with suffering. So... Yeah. And then, um, and then the, and the last with, thing was that you. as, sorry, we're, we're overlapping each other because of the quality of the, of the, uh, recording, but, um, but it, it's something with, with, with God's help, I mean, the, the, even the, um, you know, the, the paradox and the irony of, of a mother giving birth is you know with God's help, she is has co-created a human being, you know that that is being brought mm -hmm. into the world. Um, it's also because of the punishment of of original sin, ancestral sin, that there's pain in childbirth. Um, but but it is it is that is obviously overwhelmed by the reality of a, of, a, of a, as, as the Bible says, a new man being born of the world. So that there's you are you are asking the schema and the the motherhood done in. in in pain and suffering is is being carried out and is only with God's help as as every mother says the same thing um, in her motherhood because she didn't, it's not just only her that brought this child into the world. So of course, she co-created this child with our Lord and with her husband. Hmm. Um, yeah, thank you. I like that a lot. Um, so the, the, the last thing here was just... Um, the, the bishop says a lot um, in this next part, but the part that really struck me was he says, now therefore give God fitting answers to these questions, 
fearful and yet joyful. Um, and then he ends it by saying, be careful then in answering all these questions with which you shall be presented. So the, um, you know, this was something that came up time and time again during retreat. You know, I was like, Father Michael, these questions are so intense and I'm promising tremendous things and I can't do these things. And I was like kind of freaking out, right? Because like, you know how I do. Um, but the, I, I really like that he says, that he says, um, give God fitting answers to these questions, fearful and yet joyful. It's like it, it, throughout the whole service, you see, you see this, this tension, this good tension between, um, I should be so fearful in these things that I'm promising because I know that I can't actually keep them. A lot of them, <laughs> um, you know, like at one point I basically promise I'm never going to sin again. And it's like, <laughs> I was, when I was talking with you on retreat, I was like, father Michael, that like can maybe happen for like 20 minutes or something, but like <laughs> um, yeah. the maybe, and if that's like, I'm just overwhelmed with grace because it's my profession day, then it'll last 20 minutes. But I'm, I know that I'm going to sin again at some point, unless God strikes me dead right there. Maybe that's, maybe that's the plan. Um, but the, <laughs> um, but anyways, it's like, be fearful because the answers that you give here are terrifying and you will be held accountable and all of that. And yet also joyful because there's the, the other 10, the tension there is, um, I know I can't do these things, but also God is merciful and God knows I can't do these things and God's going to help me when I fall yeah. and God's. And so there's like, you see this tension throughout the whole service. And I just, I really like that that's there because I, I think that if you're missing either one of those things, either the fear or the joy, when you go into this service, then, um, then like terrible things could happen, right? Like you don't want to just like take these things that you're saying lightly because they really are tremendous, but you also don't want to fall into the the scrupulosity that would lead to despair over them. Um, so also yeah. needing this, this trust in God's mercy. Amen. So, um, Okay, I'll share maybe one or two more things before we before we wrap up. The and and I will continue this in my next episode. Um and maybe I can do back to backs um so that the next one will also come out before the profession. Um and maybe there has sure. to be a third one that comes out after the profession. <laughs> but <laughs> anyways, the um the the next question um well I guess this is like it says, and then the bishop questions the candidates asking. Um, the first one is, have you come to the Lord of your own mind and will? And this one, the response really struck both of us, Father Michael, because you, you were reading through the profession at the same time. Have you come to the Lord of your own mind and will? Yes, master, with God's help. <laughs> and we were, I remember we were both struck by that response because, um, uh, but, but the way that I read it, the way that I prayed with it um, is like, even to do something of my own mind and will, mm -hmm. I need God's help. Because left entirely to myself mm -hmm. without his help, I actually don't choose what is my own mind and will, right? Like when we, when we choose yeah. sin, when we choose wrongly, we're not actually choosing what we want. We're choosing the superficial thing that we think is going to make us happy, at least momentarily. But our deeper desire is not the thing that we're choosing when we choose sin. Um, and so I just really liked that we, we said that in order to come of our own mind and will, we need God's help. <laughs> when I was on retreat last week at Holy Transfiguration, they, the Father Damien and Father Seraphim were alternating preaching. And Father Seraphim, in one of his homilies, was talking about the line from the scriptures where they accused Jesus of casting out Satan by the power of Satan, you know, casting out Beelzebub, the power of Beelzebub. And he says, you know, he was kind of reflecting on on the various interpretations of what that means because the, the next uh, portion is, is about the unforgivable sin. You know, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit mm. is the only unforgivable sin. Um, and I, I won't go to the whole reflection. It was really beautiful, but he talks about um, repentance as being one of the things that the devil cannot do. So in other words, mm -hmm. when, if we want to distinguish ourselves from the devil, um, the devil could proclaim, you know, 
Jesus as the son of God, as he does, you know, um, but the devil can't be humble and the devil can't repent. And so, so those two things, especially, but especially he mentions homily, repentance is something the devil cannot do, cannot even in, imitate in the sense. So if we wanna make sure that we are doing God's will, if we're confused, um, whenever we have true, sincere, authentic repentance, we know we are doing God's will at that point. Um, and that's how we, you know, we kind of prevent ourselves from blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. It was point of this homily, again, there's other issues there I won't go into, but um, we, we just, if, if we turn and say, you know, am I afraid that I'm committing blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? The answer to that is to make sure you're not, is to repent. In other words, ask for forgiveness mm. and it will be given to you because mm -hmm. the devil cannot imitate that. He cannot do that. Um, so yeah, it was just a beautiful thing of, of the more we repent, the more we know that we are acting as human beings. We know we are acting more as, as children of God. We know that we are not acting as demons in the place of demons. So more repentance. Mm. And that's what you're giving your whole life to. So amen. Amen. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, 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 the next question is, he just clarifies, the bishop says, um, he makes sure that I've not come by any necessity or constraint. And, um, mm -hmm. and where I went with this with, in, in prayer was not um, like someone's forcing me to do this or, um, but rather there was a time that I was here at the monastery and I was here by necessity or constraint. And I realized this, um, mm. I've shared it in one of the other podcasts. I think I shared it in the um, the Father's, one of the Father's Heart podcasts. But um, I, I had this huge revelation on my pre-Tantra retreat in which I realized um, that even though I was confident God was calling me here, I could say no and he would still love me. And that was yeah. a tremendous release for me, a tremendous freedom, because mm -hmm. up to that point, I realized that subconsciously I had been thinking, because I'm called here, I have to say yes. I have no other choice. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I wouldn't have said that out loud. Like I said, it was totally subconscious, but um, but I only realized it once I had the freedom. And so, so I do feel like I can say that at this point, that I'm not coming here by any necessity or constraint. Um, but that was something that I, that I had to overcome. So, yeah. Um, okay. Amen. I, well, okay. I'll say one more thing before we, before we do prayer intentions. So the, um, he then asks, do you renounce the world and all it holds according to the command of the Lord? And, one of the things that I was praying with here was that um, that in renouncing the world and all that it holds, I'm even renouncing the good things for the greater good, right? Like it's not um, it's not just are you renouncing the evil things of the world, um, but but like there are a lot of goods of the world, friendships and physical affection and health um, that I'm saying I will renounce um, and. I think that what needs to happen there for all of us at the monastery, but I was, I was praying particularly about how this needs to happen for me is there needs to be this, this growth in detachment um, to hold fast to that answer. Um, even if like some of, some of those goods, the Lord still gives me at the monastery right now, you know, um, like I still have really beautiful friendships. Um, and that's a good that God is choosing to give me right now. But the point is I need to be okay. If at some point he chooses to not allow me those things, <laughs> because like, that's what renouncing yeah. the world means. I need to be okay without those things. Um, even if I have them now. So it's like in, in, in my mind, at least in the practical application, the renunciation needs to be more of a detachment than, than anything else. Um, so yeah, cause I'm not going to like just all of a sudden stop talking to my friends after my life profession. Don't look, don't worry, Laura, I'm not going to just stop talking to you after my life profession. Um, hmm. but I, I do need to be, um, to, yeah, to be open to, um, to whatever, whatever God is asking of me in the future, you know, like through new hegumena or through like whatever the circumstances are that, um, that I really have renounced the world. And that is absolutely impossible to predict. It's like, you can't, 
go through everything that you appreciate about the world or everything that you still are able to participate in, even though you're a monk. Like you can't go through everything and say, I need to make sure that I'm okay with each of these things being taken away from me if it's God's will or if it's mother's will or whatever it may be. Um, But so you have to obviously keep your eyes fixed on Christ and say, like my relationship with you, Christ, through asceticism, you know, penance and and union in theosis trumps all of these things. So when when mm-hmm. an unexpected sacrifice arises, I'm going to say this is going to be hard, um, but it, it's done. It, the fruit of it will, because Christ can even take ill-intentioned fruit and make it beautiful. But the the fruit of this is going to be. Um, more intense theosis, union with God, holiness, etc. So it's it's not like you can you can before you need to become a nun. You need, you need to be able to predict and and know that you're able to give up everything the world has to offer. But you can say, I can give the whole world because Christ is is bigger, more beautiful, more helpful, more joyful, and 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 my telos, my ultimate end um, that I'm moving very very directly and intentionally towards through this life of monasticism. Um, okay. Uh, do you have anything else before I get my parents' attention? Nope. Go ahead. Thank you. That was great. And I look forward okay. to the second time, the second uh, round, second episode. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. I'm going to ask for prayers. Um, I guess mostly prayers of gratitude for our listener advisory committee, which we've mentioned on the podcast before, but we meet with them every few months and they give us feedback on what they, um, they, they listen to, to most of the episodes, if not all. And, and they give us feedback on, um, like what they like, what they don't like, what they think we need to work on, so on and so forth. And there's just like, um, I've been super grateful for them recently because we've gotten some, some feedback from listeners who have no idea what the listener advisory committee has said to us. Um, they have no idea some of the changes that we've put in place because of the listener advisory committee. And yet they've reached out and they've said like, hey, I've noticed you've done these things and it's made the podcast a lot better and um, so on and so forth. So uh, so the I'm just really grateful for them because what they're doing... The, their their courage in giving us feedback, even even some of the negative feedback, um, their courage in that has really helped it, I think, to make it a better podcast, which is obviously what you and I, Father Michael, really desire, like all for the glory of God. And so um, mm-hmm. like that's more important than than us doing what we necessarily want to do or like what we find the most, whatever. So um, so I'm not going to say their names because I don't know that everyone on the committee would want to be known, but um, but thank you to our listener advisory committee and please, um, fellow listeners, please continue to pray for them and for their their wisdom and their guidance. Amen. Uh, my intention is for as as school goes back into session. Um, with the craziness of COVID and masks and vaccines and such. Um, just pray for everybody involved in the school process. I've been having so many conversations mm. and not only that, but the whole, you know, many places have the vaccine mandates and, and I know there's all kinds of debate about this and there's no clear answer, but just pray for those who are are navigating these waters. And by that, I mean kids, the kids going back to school, um, the, the administration, I had a great, conversation, a hard conversation with the principal yesterday, um, trying to figure out what to do on the side of the administration of the schools. Uh, parents, of course, pray for parents that are that are are trying to to be the primary educators of their children and to lead their children to holiness and education and and um, you know reason and intelligence in the midst of this kind of crazy season. And then also pray for us priests who are trying to be uh, religious leaders and beacons of of Christ's will and give advice according to God in the, in the midst of a very divided flock um, who who believe very different things and about about all this stuff revol- revolving in COVID and what it means, especially for children. Of course, we're very passionate about children. So um, just pray for all of those as as school resumes, as mandates are, are being um, enforced or prescribed, um, all those who are making decisions, all those who will will lose their jobs, all those who are back to school, all those who are trying to lead in the midst of all this. Just pray for all of them and all of us. I would appreciate it. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Is that everything? Okay. Father, yeah, Father, give the blessing. Okay. 
May the Lord bless you all and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you, have mercy on you. May he allow you always to be inspired by the vocations of others, um, to appreciate fully your own vocation through the analysis of others' vocations. For those either discerning vocations, especially to monastic life, um, may our Lord God give you um, his guidance, his consolation, his conviction, um, his strength, his power, his protection as you continue to discern May all of those you who are already living vocations that God has called you to that is not monastic, please may God give you the ability to support those who are, to appreciate what they're doing, to love them in the midst of that, to give them the support that God may will, to pray that they may live out those lives with, with worthiness, the worthiness that only God can give. May the Lord bless you in all your vocations and all your struggles, all your crosses and all your joys. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Love you. Love you, listeners. Keep praying for us. Love you. I love you, sister. Love you, uh, Doc Moses. Love you, too. And all you listeners. God bless you all. (laughs) 